Hey everyone, welcome back. We are talking about um, natural health products in Canada and we're going to go through a bit of an introductory approach to understanding what they are and how they are different from food products, but how um, many people in the food science and food product development sphere get into developing natural health products because in many cases they do resemble food products. And if, if you went back about 10 years ago, many food products were actually licensed as na natural health products. And so it's a bit convoluted, the history of natural health products, but let's dive right in and figure out what on earth am I talking about when I say natural health products in Canada. So at the end of this video, you'll be able to define what is a natural health product and describe how it's similar and different from a food product. We'll define how NHPs are able to make health-related claims, and when I say NHP, that is a natural health product, and we'll describe the risk-based uh, approaches that Health Canada uses for reviewing products for approval. And this will be a multi-part um, video series, and I'll have additional videos talking a bit more about the, the, the regulatory resources that are available to you. Um, but let's just dive right in here. So what is a natural health product? Well, uh, being at home with COVID, I went digging around in my cupboard thinking, well, I know what a natural health product is. Can I find some examples? Well, um, I pulled these from my cupboard, and, and to be quite frank, I keep these usually in my office because Oftentimes at lunchtime, I don't have more than a couple minutes to uh, eat something. And as much as Niagara College has a fantastic cafeteria offering and our benchmark uh, restaurant and bench to go have some fantastic offerings, it can get expensive to buy lunch all the time. And so um, taking a food supplement as, as one of these is a very convenient way to get some decent nutrition in a really time effective way. I can mix it up and drink it down in a, 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 like two, three minutes and be back on my way uh, busy helping students. So I took a look at these two different products and again I have no connection to these companies and I'm saying everything in a very factual uh, non-disparaging way but uh, honestly this is a food product. The Vega One is a food product and the Veggie Greens is a natural health product, and you're likely scratching your head going, but they're both green smoothies. Well, it's, it, in the end, you can represent your product as one or the other, and it really comes down to the burden of regulatory evidence and what sort of marketing claims you want to be able to make against your product. And so, let's dig in a little bit deeper here. So, the, the uh, Vega One, as a green smoothie is a food product. As I mentioned before, it's regulated under the Food and Drugs Act and Food and Drugs Regulation, and it has a standard nutri nutrition facts table. Um, it's got a standard ingredient declaration, a standard allergen declaration, and again, we've had videos talking about how these labels are developed. And the claims that we are seeing here in terms of protein and um, method of production and nutrient content claims, they are all compliant with the Food and Drugs Regulation B01513 and all of those wonderful tables that we did in the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry. So these nutrient content claims and method of production claims have all been validated from the Food and Drugs Regulation, not from the Natural Health Products Regulation. And so, yes, this is a green smoothie and it's got a lot of green stuff, pea protein, flaxseed, acacia gum, pea starch, hemp protein, and so on, and all sorts of dried up vegetables, but it's a food. And let's compare that to this as a natural health product. So first off, uh, one key uh, feature that we can see is down here in the bottom right hand corner photo, it says NPN and a whole string of numbers. That means that it has been registered with Health Canada as a natural product and it has a natural product number registration. It is therefore in their database of food supplements and you'll notice that they are using wording on the package that it is a supplement. And so think about supplements also could be vitamins or capsules, um, herbal remedies and so on and those are not foods, they are supplements, and so they're very deliberate with their language. It is a supplement. It has a detailed listing of medicinal 
and non-medicinal ingredients. And it does have a health claim. Now, that you're going to laugh when you read this claim. It says, it's a source of antioxidants for the maintenance of good health. And you're likely scratching your head saying, well, what does that do for you? Well, honestly, I figure this is like a salad in a glass. Um, and it's got some good green vegetables and a lot of dietary fiber in it. Um, source of antioxidants for the maintenance of good health is one of these what we call low-risk um, low risk claims and and therefore, it's easier from a burden of evidence perspective to be able to uh, get this approved. It has dosing information. Take one scoop with 250 mils water once daily. And it also has a, a limiting statement. Do not exceed 12 weeks of consumption. And last but not least, it has a risk cautionary statement. Blood, uh, don't take this product if you are on blood thinners, have iron deficiency, liver disorders, kidney stones, are pregnant or breastfeeding. And so... It sounds more like an over-the-counter medication than it does a food product, but I am going to bet you anything that this product was designed by food scientists because oftentimes foods, food scientists have this, uh, the capabilities in formulation, the capabilities in cost control, the capabilities in packaging technology, and often align themselves with either... Um, Clinical, uh, clinical medicine uh, specialists or nutrition specialists to be able to develop natural health products of this type. So let's jump into some Health Canada details here. An NHP is a substance or a combination of substances described in Schedule 1 of the Natural Health Products Regulation, a homeopathic medicine or a traditional medicine that's intended to provide a pharmacologic activity or other direct effect in diagnosing, treating, mitigating, or preventing a disease, disorder, or abnormal physiologic state or its symptoms in humans, correcting or co restoring or correcting organic functions in humans, or modifying organic functions in humans, such as modifying those functions in a manner that maintains or promotes health. So what does all this mean? This is taken from uh, Health Canada's um, guidance documents for NHPs. And what does it mean? If now suddenly, if you have your product registered as an NHP, you can start to make claims against that product. And you can use those products as part of um, part of a regime for uh, either preventing disease or mitigating and managing disease that is already existing. You'll know it's not going to cure anything, but it's going to be part of uh, either prevention or mitigation of disease. So let's jump out here. I noted uh, in my introduction that 10 years ago, um, many food products look like uh, and were actually registered as NHPs and there was a bit of a loophole. So the, the NHP, the Natural Health Products Regulation came into force in uh, January 1st, 2004 and it's gone through a variety of different um, modernization periods and, and as I mentioned in the very beginning uh, a wide variety of food products that were enhanced with if I can use the term nutraceuticals or functional foods, all sorts of superfood type additives um, they were classed as NHPs and the food industry got a bit of a bum rap because they were using the NHP regulation as a bit of a loophole to uh, skirt the food and drugs regulation. And so I think of uh, some examples. Um, it wasn't until uh, about 10 years ago that stevia was permitted as a uh, non-nutritive sweetener in Canada. And meanwhile, if you were uh, creating a natural health product, you could use stevia because it was not regulated under the Food and Drugs Regulation. Um, stevia was not approved in Section six, er, Division 16 of the Food and Drugs Regulation, so people would make products, add a herbal supplement or something, and then sweeten it with stevia and call it an NHP. And there were companies, for example, making um, diet soda with stevia, and they would add a little bit of turmeric or a little bit of, uh, I don't know, even vitamin C is on the list of uh, natural health products, add a little bit of something that you can make a claim against, and suddenly you had a NHP and therefore didn't have to follow the, F the food and drugs regulation. And it really came to a head, I think of one example where it was applesauce. And applesauce normally has vitamin C in it, and you can, in the natural health products regulation, make a claim against vitamins and supplements. Um, so it contained vitamin C and the claim was contains dietary antioxidants or something to that extent. 
And meanwhile, the applesauce had the vitamin C in it because it was um, also providing uh, a means of preventing discoloration. As you know, apples and apple products can discolor brown unless you're using ascorbic acid or vitamin C as a means of uh, preventing that discoloration. And so they had this applesauce and they were calling it an NHP and they were uh, like pomegranate flavored applesauce. Good source of dietary antioxidants. And it was just so ridiculous because it was really functionally no different than their standard applesauce. But they were trying to get the NHP uh, marketing halo off of this product. Anyways, that went through a, a major reform um, and about 10 years ago, and as such, now NHPs are restricted to being vitamins and minerals, herbal remedies, homeopathic medicines, traditional medicines such as traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurveda or other indigenous medicinal traditions, um, probiotics, and other products such as amino acids and essential, essential fatty acids, and all delivered in a uh, form that resembles far more a supplement than a food product. That said, there are some of these borderline products, think gummy vitamins, or think of these uh, beverage mixes where it's not meant to be lip-smackingly delicious, it's meant to be a nutrition supplement or a health-promoting supplement, but it may be on that borderline of looking and acting like a food product. So, NHPs are used and marketed for a number of health reasons, for prevention of diseases or illnesses or conditions, reduction of health risks, and maintenance of good health. And you'll see that sort of triage-based uh, approach and a risk-based approach. Most of the NHPs are going to be in that maintenance of good health or reduction of health risks. And um, they have to be safe to be used as over-the-counter products and safe to be used without medical supervision. And so, in theory, you as a, as, a, as a lay person, I realize I'm talking to food scientists and food professionals on this channel, but uh, as a lay person, that individual could and should be able to consume that product and um, recognize their own symptoms and recognize how to dose this product themselves without medical supervision. And as such, you have to build in a risk-based approach to this product so that within wide margins of safety, individuals can go exactly with that approach. So they do contain what is classified as medicinal ingredients, and these are ingredients that are substances set out in Schedule 1 of the Natural Health Products Regulation, and therefore they're biologically active. Biologically active meaning that when you consume them, they will change your physiology in some form. It could be as simple as adding dietary antioxidants or increasing your vitamin or mineral status, but it could be other things like um, acting as a nervine agent or um, altering your cognition or acting as a sedative. And so again, it, they do have a, a physiologic action on your body. And those medicinal ingredients can be used as part of mitigation of disease, correcting organic function in humans, or modifying those functions so that you have optimized health. Now, I also mentioned, too, that um, natural health products can fall under two different claims formats. They can fall under the traditional health claims, and that it would include things like traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurveda from the Indian subcontinent, and other uh, traditional indigenous medicines from around the world uh, with historical precedents. And um, the other space that you can claim under is under modern health claims. And that's where you are doing scientific, liter uh, scientific literature reviews. And we, we have had some slide uh, presentations in this channel about the importance of understanding the burden of evidence of different qualities of scientific literature, as well as performing uh, new clinical trials on those products to see how it modifies individuals' physiologic function. Um, the, the need for this category of traditional health claims is, is, I think, really important in that when the original and, um, natural health products uh, regulation came into place, the burden of evidence was focused solely on scientific literature. And that's all fine and good. It's very expensive to go about doing new clinical trials. And meanwhile, many of the traditional um, medicinal practices from around the world said, we've got 
traditional literature, in, in many cases going back hundreds or thousands of years, showing the traditional use of these products under these contexts. So there are tomes and tomes of literature on Ayurveda and on traditional Chinese medicine. In the case of indigenous medicine, in many cases, this is oral tradition. And it's through the passage of information from generation to generation through knowledge keepers within various First Nations and Indigenous communities that that understanding of, of the wellness practice comes into play. And so Health Canada did go through a modernization period accepting for traditional health claims as part of that. You still have a burden of evidence that you need to present, but they are much more open-minded about what that looks like. The main thing is in that context, any sort of risk-based uh, risk based approach still needs to be taken in that if it's a traditional uh, medicinal claim that at the same time, if people are uh, self, uh, self-diagnosing self and self-prescribing these products, that there's not going to be a risk of toxicity from that product. Oops, pardon me, I'm skipping ahead to too fast here. Now there are non-medicinal ingredients in these products and these are any substances that are going to confer consistency or form to the medicinal ingredients. So for example in many tablets there's starches, there are um, binding agents, there could be carrier agents, there could be sweeteners or flavoring. Um, and so they shouldn't exhibit pharmacologic effects, they shouldn't be contradictory to the product's recommended purpose, and they shouldn't exceed minimum concentration for the formula. They shouldn't impact on the bioavailability of the bioactive ingredients, and they should be safe. So uh, when we say um, should be safe, oftentimes we're using, we're going back to the Food and Drugs Regulation, and in particular looking at Division 16 and the appropriate lists of incorporation for technical ingredients to know these are other ingredients that can be used safely for um, for food type applications and therefore they would be relevant to pharmaceutical type applications as well. So you do, when developing that product, have to define some clear conditions. So you have to give a recommended use of purpose, you have to give a dosage, you have to give a route of administration. And so you may be thinking, well, don't people just eat or swallow all of these? Well, Natural health products could also include things such as creams or topical lotions. They could include uh, sprays. They could um, include tinctures. They could in, uh, include uh, suppositories. And as such, you do need to indicate exactly what the route of administration is. And then you need to know about the dosing and the frequency of dosing. You need to know about the duration of use and any sort of risk-related cautions or warnings or contraindications related with the use of this product. And what is, what's, what's fascinating, you may be saying, well, this is really overwhelming. How does anyone make these products? Well, in a, in a few moments, I'm going to sh show you, and I'll have a second video series where we actually dig into the resources that Health Canada has prepared to help make this a little bit easier for product developers who may be um, asked to create products that have various um, health promoting properties. So it, uh, just further from a theory perspective, to sell an NHP in Canada, you do have to get a product license application and you have to submit it to Health Canada. You have to show your evidence of safety and efficacy. And here's the wonderful thing. If it is a low risk product, you can use pre-cleared information from Health Canada's database. And in a uh, second video, we will jump out and use the Health Canada database to look at the information, including single ingredient monographs to help speed up that process. It, that Those monographs though really can only be used um, from a clearance perspective on low risk products. EA can be used as supporting evidence in medium and higher risk products, but they're not the be all and end all. On, on those uh, medium and high risk products, you do need to have additional evidence. Now. Health Canada uses a risk-based approach to NHP approvals, and so most of the products that uh, food product developers get involved with tend to be in that low risk, where you can take them and they've got really wide dosing margins. So if you took two or three times the dose or you took it longer than you should be, you're not going to be causing yourself 
harm from a toxicity perspective. And the other thing about the low risk ones is that it's typically for um, diseases or symptoms that are going to be short term or self limiting. So things like um, um, uh, routine rashes or you saw the one on my greens, uh, veggie greens, where it said for maintenance of good health. Well, that's <laughs> that's pretty low risk. You'd hope that I'm in decent health to start with. Um, others, uh, short term and self limiting things like uh, minor rashes, uh, um, routine uh, respiratory illnesses, um, maintenance of, of of good weight. These are basic things that are very low risk. And the medium risk is where you, if you start to have issues with dosing or if your disease and symptoms have longer duration, so think about arthritis or diabetes, um, if it's not managed properly, then you, you could have additional risk. And then high risk is where there's either a potential risk of toxicity or these are diseases or conditions that should be completely overseen by medicinal practitioners. High risk also does include high risk populations, children, pregnant and lactating women being our high risk or our dominant high risk populations, followed by um, the elderly. And you do need to be aware that if you are targeting your product at these populations, you are going to be changing your risk carrier or, or your burden of evidence on your risk. So the other piece of the puzzle, they do, um, they do take a very serious consideration to the types of disease and condition claims that you're working on. So for example, last week I had a conversation with some students and they were saying, hey, we'd like to make a product for concussions. Can we, can we use um, these food products? And I'm like, nope, that's a high risk um, a schedule eight type disease. And that should be under the supervision of a healthcare practitioner. And therefore um, the food product is unlikely to get approval. Um, whereas if it's a major disease and condition claim, the, um, the, it, you are in a completely different risk categorization as well. Last but not least, if it's a minor disease or condition claim, then it's, it's, it's much more likely to get approval from Health Canada. Because again, these major disease and condition claims, you need to have a much higher burden of evidence to be able to justify with, uh, additional clinical trial data with, um, a much more robust literature review to prove the efficacy of your product. And you need to show that it's going to be used in some sort of integrated health system. Now, at this point, I'm going to stop this video because it's, it's going to get a little bit long. Um, I'm going to have a part two video where we actually go into some of the resources that are provided by Health Canada to uh, identify how do, you, how do you think about from a formulation perspective, how do you do all of those other compliance components? How do you know from a formulation perspective how much to dose in your product so that you can think about, do I have an, uh, an effective dose, but am I also controlling my costs? Because the more bioactive component, it's usually the bioactive that's the most expensive component in your food product. So I'm going to stop the video here, but uh, you know where to find me if you have questions. I always love to hear your questions because it helps me, one, know that there's uh, people out there enjoying the videos. But secondly, I can customize videos based off of some of the feedback that I'm getting. Admittedly, I'm making most of these videos for my courses at Niagara College, but I am finding that um, many people in the industry are enjoying them and are getting a lot uh from a learning and capacity building perspective. So yeah, do ask questions and we'll talk to you again real soon.